All right, I'm going to be in Galatians this morning. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. We'll have a little lesson here on a, a doctrine of adoption. Adoption. In Galatians 4 and verse 3, the Bible says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem deem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit, capital S there, the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you today for your tender mercy and grace, Lord. And I uh, pray that you would glorify yourself in this service today. Thank you for uh, Brother Mike and Christina, that, that, uh, that you've got them well and, and over their, their crud, Lord. And pray that they'll go on for God. And I love Brother Mike, and I know how he loves you and uh, stands for you and your word. And uh, help us, Lord, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Lord. And let us be attentive to the preaching and teaching of your holy word. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, I like the part here. It says, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. And that's where folks say, well, you need to get Jesus into your heart. Or uh, uh, since Jesus came into my heart, I've seen preachers that kind of don't like that. Well, you, you trusted Christ. He didn't really come into your heart. Well, it's from this verse here. Since Jesus came into my heart, the spirit of his son into your hearts. He changes your hearts. Now, I want to talk a little bit about adoption. There's not a, a lot of preaching on adoption, but it's uh, a very uh, significant and wonderful uh, doctrine in the word of God. And with adoption, we become children of God through the uh, faith in God's beloved son who as a son of God became the son of man that we might become the sons of God. And uh, my wife was, was adopted as a child. My, my wife was 19 years old before she found out that she was adopted. It's somewhat traumatic. But there's a lot of things that occur with adoption. Uh, my wife's adopted family took her in and they cared for her and they loved her. And she became the legal heir of her adoptive parents. And uh, she had a, a wonderful family. Her uh, adopted dad uh, died fairly young uh, when Joyce was a little girl. But, you know, in, under adoption, the adopted child as a, is the lawful heir of their adoptive parents and, and has the same rights as if they were born a natural birth into that family. And so when we are adopted by God, we become the sons of God through faith in his name. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So now, uh, where regeneration has to do with son making, uh, Regeneration uh, has to do with a, a believer's nature and will, but adoption has more to do with son placing. You're not placed in the body of Christ. As many of you are baptized into Christ, are baptized into his death, and then, then uh, his spirit of God places you in a spiritual body, the body of Christ, and that spiritual body is manifested by a literal, visible, physical, local church. That you're a part of. Uh, God manifest in the flesh. So. You take a child of the world. And you give that child the position. And the advantages. Of a son born into the family of God. That's a wonderful thing. To know that you're a child of God. Uh, Moses was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And I. Uh, remember he said that, that he. He chose to suffer with God's people but rather than to, uh, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But he, he could have had it all as a son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he chose God's people. And the adoption of God involves not only the natural, but also the super, supernatural as we receive a divine nature. 
Bible says we, we have exceeding great and precious promises whereby we might be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, whenever we're adopted into the family of God, he gives us a new nature. When it says about that spirit of God coming into your heart, you have that divine nature. And of course, the body hasn't been redeemed yet. So you've got a, a fight that begins, the old nature versus the new. The old nature is contrary to the new nature. And uh, we know that because Paul said, what I know within me that is within my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He was saved. He also said one day that the Lord will redeem these vile, our vile bodies. What a thing to say to a man. Man, I prepped in the mirror this morning trying to get, and then you remember that God said these bodies are vile. Kind of a wake-up call sometimes for us. And, and we live in a, a nation, a, a world that is, there's so much preoccupation with the flesh. You know, if, if some of you are on Facebook, well, you'll see those new profile pictures every day. Our new profile picture. You know, we're a mess. You know, we're a mess. Preoccupation with, with the flesh. And uh, I don't want to stay there. But uh, Judges 18, it says, as thou art, so are they. Each one resemble the children of the king. So there's traits that we take on when we're adopted into the family of God and the spirit of the, the Lord comes into our heart and that new nature uh, starts to make its presence known. Your ideas should change about some things. There's fruit of the nine fruit of the spirit over there in Galatians 522 and the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You may not have had too much of any of those things before you trusted Christ. But now you've got a nature that, that has a propensity toward that fruit of the spirit. And, and what you do with it, it depends on how much you'll be of use to God. He wants all of you, but but you got all of him the moment you got saved, but he didn't get all of you. You've got to submit to that. Paul came to that conclusion one day when he, when he said, well, to will is present with me. Over in Romans 7, he said, to will is present with me. Man, I want to do, do right. I want to live right. He said, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Well, I think he finally figured out that God did not give us our will to perform with. He gave us our will that we might submit. Submit to his will. As long as we're doing the performing, the fruit of the spirit is not going to have much opportunity to display itself, manifest itself in our lives. And uh, David said over in Psalms 57 too, he said, I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performeth all things for me. Hmm. God wants to do the performance in your life. He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You have to let him do the performing in your life. You need to give up on your will, submit your will to his will. Uh, submission, that's all. Submission, that's all it's ever been in salvation. That's all it has ever been in sanctification is a willingness to give it to God. Our, our, the care leaves you, all, all those things that you thought were so important will go away whenever you start giving your life totally to God and submitting to his will in everything. All the stress and all the craziness that, that, that we let uh, cumber us will go away if you learn to submit and relax, chill out. I told you, we use that verse with Paul and the addictions crowd because uh, folks have tried over and over again to, to get off drugs, quit smoking, quit this and quit that. And they'll try and try and try and, and, and try something. And they find after so many years that all their attempts and all their, the more they tried, the, the less they succeeded. And, and that's because they've never submitted. They've all done it all in the flesh. You can work and work and work at trying to get over some sinful aspect of your life. 
and never get the victory over it. Uh, we've all seen it. We've seen people come to the altars for 20 years over the same sin, and they can't get the victory over it. And I suspect that's because they're trying to get the victory in the flesh. Well, I've done this, and I've done that. Well, you need to quit doing. You need to relax and get over it and give it to God and let God do it. I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Let me move on. But just as a natural child resembles his parents, in many ways we as children of God are given God's love, we're given his compassion, uh, we're given his charity toward others, and uh, we, in effect, with our new nature, should demonstrate all those traits of our Heavenly Father. Uh, Phyllis uh, told the preacher one time, said, well, I've got a temper, I'm just like my daddy. Fellas, and the preacher said, well, you've got, you've got a heavenly father now. You need to act more like him. Sometimes, sometimes we, we want to take pride. We want to take pride in, in some of those traits that our daddy had. And my daddy had some good traits, but he had some, other, some traits that, uh, uh, that I had to take some time to get over. That temper trait, you've got you've to get beyond that if you're a Christian. You can't fly off the, a man that uh, don't control his own spirit is like a building with no walls. You've got to learn to get beyond a lot of those things of the flesh and a lot of those genetic propensities that you have. See, you've got uh, now a new nature and yielding to that nature. And God and God's word, he will always, seems like when he tells you to stop doing this, he'll always give you an alternative, something different to do that pleases him. He said, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but instead of that, be filled with the Spirit. He gives you an alternative. Don't get high on alcohol or drug, but you get high on the Holy Spirit of God. He says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands. Always gives an alternative. Let him that, uh, lie not to your neighbor, but every man, you know, the truth. He gives an alternative. So that man is told, let him work with his hands. So God has a better way, a better alternative to some of the choices, most of the choices we make. But we're born again into the family of God. We take on those family traits. And a regeneration is the internal change wrought in us by the Spirit of God and results in a new nature that should manifest itself, uh, one that resembles our Lord, the perfecting of the saints. We talked about that the other day. Uh, the word perfect, uh, some will say it means completion. I liken it to being Christ-like because he is the superlative. He is perfection. As a master, the servant should be as his master. So the perfecting of the saints is Saints becoming more Christ-like. What's the verse says? I will waken and be satisfied with thy likeness. Problem is, a lot of folks, folks aren't satisfied with his likeness. They don't want to be like Christ. I mean, who are you going to hang, hang around with? If you're like Christ, who are you going to run with? I will awaken and be satisfied with thy likeness. Sometimes that, that's tough. You, you, you think you want to be like him, and then the closer you get to being like him, the, the more your worldly carnal friends start dis distancing themselves from you. Now you're learning who Jesus Christ was. The world hated him. All. The Pharisees couldn't stand him. The fact they crucified him. My, my. Where was I here? Uh, but there's privileges uh, of adoption. Adoption is the action of God whereby he admits those born again to the conditions and privileges of children by a sovereign act. And uh, this is a position based upon the internal change that regeneration produces. Now, privileges of ado adoption, we become, because of our adoption, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ephesians 2.19, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, 
but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Uh, with that comes a deliverance uh, from bondage, and that, that bondage to sin, that slavish fear. I was, I was one of the, the greatest, the most important impetus for me to get saved was the fact that I was afraid to go to hell. I was afraid of God. I was taught to fear God, not just reverential respect, but, but a fear of hell. I sought out God, said to God, boy, I didn't want to go to hell. Because I, I, I came to the conclusion that I deserved it. That's what I deserved. That's what I had coming to me. That's what I was going to get if somebody didn't step in and make a way for me to not go to hell. And that was Jesus Christ. I was taught uh, from a child that Jesus was who he said he was. He was the son of God. I learned uh, through the, the word of God that he was in fact God. God manifest in the flesh. <laughs> And he was the Savior, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Of things in heaven, of things in earth. I forget how that goes. But, uh, and I came to God. Man, that, that burden, that, that bondage was lifted from me. And, and, I, and I was... Uh, taught by folks who rightly divided that book and knew that, that I was kept by the power of God and the salvation. I didn't know. I didn't fear anymore. Didn't fear anymore. Romans 8, 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit, capital S, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So, as a, a child of God, even though I was an adopted child, I also became an heir. My, my. Uh, and if children, it says in Romans 8, 17, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And uh, I felt a duty. I remember in, in, in police work there in, in military, there's a sense of duty where you feel compelled uh, to do what's expected of you to do. A child of God should feel a sense of duty. Now, you're not under the law. You have a free will. You, you have an old nature. You can do what you want to do. But it's nice if you feel a sense of duty. I, I, I know what God saved me from. I, I'm reminded... Of what I deserved and, and God saved me from. And I feel a sense of duty to serve him. And, and that sense of duty sometimes will keep you out of sin. That's, uh, that temptation will come along and, and then you'll think of your Savior and what he did. and Say, Lord, I'm sorry for even thinking about those things. Lord, forgive me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me to get... Through this, Lord, I know what you did for me. Don't let me be a rascal when it comes to those things that I know are displeasing to you. If God's against it, one of our uh, principles and reformers unanimous, if God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, you should be too. A lot of folks have never heard where God's stand is on, on anything. They live in sin. They, did, they didn't know it was a sin. They thought everybody was doing it. It's okay. They don't, they, they don't know. Well, you've got to submit yourself to the preaching and the teaching and the reading of God's word. Seek you out the book of the Lord and read. Get into the book. My, my, my. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that, the duty of obedience uh, to what, how God wants you to live. He tells you how he wants you to live. And uh, now when I was a boy growing up, it didn't take me very long to understand that I needed to do what my daddy asked me to do. Let me change that. He never asked me to do anything. He commanded me to do this and to do that. And I better do it. He usually didn't ask, he usually didn't command me twice. 
And that didn't mean I wanted to do it, but I, my daddy commanded me to do it. He was my daddy, and I did it. Later, you had to mature into a man many times before you respected that. Hmm. I respected my mama, and uh, you know she made me go to church. I didn't want to go to church. I wanted to lay up in bed and then watch cartoons. But she she insisted there was no I, there was no excuse. I went to Sunday school. I went to church, and that that power, that word of God finally took root in me. The Sunday school teachers had the wisdom. They taught those Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments became a schoolmaster for me. They, they showed me the holiness of God. Thou shalt not do that. It's pretty negative. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And some of those thou shalt not, I'd, I'd, I'd got pretty close to. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm doing something wrong in relationship to what those commandments teach. And the Bible says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So that, that law became a schoolmaster for me. And I know I was a mess. Uh, God was holy and I saw that in relationship to him, I certainly was not. So I cried out to Jesus Christ for salvation. But obeying, it started with obeying my parents. Doing what they told me to do. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants you to be conformed to his image. Some of you folks are taking an awful long time uh, to get around to being that. It's going to be a little culture shock when you get to glory. Because you will be conformed to his image. I mean, he predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And uh, if, if you get that, if you pick up on that, it will set you free from all the anxiety all the craziness of this life, all the things we are worried about. Matthew 6, 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, the Lord speaking says, Take, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, or yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment, and behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns yet your heavenly father feedeth them are you not much better than they are see God saying you trust me which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature and why take ye thought for raiment consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not neither do they spin and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek the lost world. That's a, that's a pretty precious promise right there. For your heavenly father, do you notice it said your heavenly father? Those, those birds and those, are, those things are created beings. They don't have a heavenly father. They have a creator. But you have a heavenly father. Mm. Your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things, all that stuff we stress about and worry over. What are we, oh, what are we going to eat? How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going <sighs> to? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be 
provided unto you, will be given unto you. God said, you trust me, I'll make sure that you, you work. The Bible says uh, man doesn't work, neither should he eat. You work hard and God will make sure that you're taken care of. And he wants you to put it on him. He wants you to seek him first. Follow his guide and his direction. He'll light up a path for you to follow, and then you have an option to walk in the light. As he is in the light, or you can walk whichever way you want to walk. Mm. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Hmm. Boy, if we could only go there, if we could only know how, how much God loves us and just give up. Quit doing the performing. Submit to God. Let him direct your path. Our word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He's got a path he wants you to walk. I bring this up often. Jeremiah preached a message uh, about God's will. God's will is the same for all of us, but his plan is individual. You know, God wants us to be holy. God wants us, you know, all those things God wants is his will for our lives. But he also has a plan designed just for you. And he'll, he'll light up a path for you to take, but you have the option you know, you, you can take door number two or door number three if you want to. <clears throat> but if you want the blessings of God, yield to him. And in, now another side of that corn, coin is once that you become a child of God, you become subject to your father's correction. I found when I disobeyed my daddy, I had something coming to me that I didn't particularly like. I recall vividly the sound of a leather belt going through about seven belt loops. <laughs> and I knew what was in store for this little boy. I won't go there. Hebrews 12, 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reference. Uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But if he for but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of a righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It ought, you need to understand that it's there for your good. It should, if you allow it, it'll do you some good. If you're exercised by it. And see, God's chastisement and God's correction is always remedial. He's not there to punish you. He's there to bring you back in line to that conformance to the image of his son. He wants to make you into what you can be for him. My, my. We have an inheritance of, of future glory. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. 1 Peter 1, 4, uh, to an inheritance incorruptible. Peter said, surely I must put off this my tabernacle to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Can't be corrupted. Can't be defiled. The Bible says, as far as we're concerned, we are perfected forever, it says over in Hebrews. 
perfected them forever. And as a child of God, it, we become somewhat of a mystery to the world. They don't, they don't get us. The, the world really don't, don't get us. Uh, behold what... John, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. We become a mystery to the world because the world don't get a Bible-believing Christian. Don't get it. With all, with all the craziness out there in the world, what is this about? What's this biblical Christianity about? We become a mystery to the world. When, but with adoption, we have a family relationship then with all believers. 1 John 3, 1 uh, said that. Now look at uh, John 13, 34. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. That is a passage that caused me a lot of grief and a lot of pain. Uh, most of you know I, I do a, a prayer walk at night. I live out in the country and I walk up and down that country road and I bring up my prayer list from A to Z. I got to use alphabetical order because I forget so many so much so I'll go through that prayer list calling out the names and ask God uh, to pray for their uh, their health their house to preach their ministry and just gone through a series on the love of God it says we're taught of God how to love and, and that love of God is manifest abroad in, in our 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 hearts, not the worldly lustful love, but the fruit of the Spirit love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So I said, Lord, I would like you to teach me to love others as you have loved me. I did, I, I should, I guess I should have thought about that a little bit because. There was a, a girl, a lady we'd taken into our home. She showed up in full uh, heroin withdrawal. And uh, we detoxed her to try to natural herbal detox. She got beyond her need at that time. And uh, she came to us church for four years. She did wonderfully. And I'm, when I asked God to teach me to love others as you have loved me, within two weeks, things went south. That girl that we had fallen in love with began to disappoint us. Started using drugs again. Started stealing from us. Stealing from some people in the church. It really went south. And, 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 and the, more, the, the, the more crazy stuff she did, the more that I felt like I, I loved her and wanted to be there for her. And wanted to, to go behind her and pay debts and do this for her. And I says, God, I think I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to get You love me even through my disappointment to you and through, through all the things that I've done to grieve you and bring you pain. You still love me. Yes. We learn to love others as he has loved us. God taught me a lesson I'll never forget. I'll never forget. How do you get there? Some of you parents have been there. You've had wayward children. And you love, you love them as much or more than you did before, even though they've gone crazy, gone, that's what you say back in the country, gone Berkshire on you. You know, they've, uh, but you still love them and you want them, you want them back. And, and, and it's painful. That's the kind of love that is painful. God's love for us was painful. It cost him something. Thank you, Lord. Got sidetracked, but that's okay. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. As I have loved you that you also love one another. 
1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As Son, uh, we also get guidance from the Father. It's referred to in Scripture as a comforter, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God. Jesus Christ indwells the believer. He that hath not the Spirit of Christ is none of his. But that's given to you the moment you get saved, that Christ indwells you. As our, our text verse said, he, his spirit comes into our heart and it guides us. It, it, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit, if you become sensitive to it, will guide and direct your every step. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He'll direct every step. Now you can, you can, uh, you can sear that conscience. You, you can write that holy, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit off to where you don't hear it anymore. If you're not listening for it, you're not going to hear it. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All believers have a likeness to God, marking them out as his in this present world. You show, you'll stand out. The, what's a verse where the disciples showed them that said they, they observed that their countenance, that they had been with Jesus. So he'll change your very countenance. Somebody talked about that at the RU the other night. Their whole countenance had changed. And people wondering what's going on with them. And because you're sons, Galatians 4, 6, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. <coughs> I got to hurry up here. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 4, when God, when God adopts, he sanctifies. Wherefore, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Got that new nature. Fights with the old nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God will take a lion. He'll turn it into a lamb. It says in Revelation 3.12, I will write on him the name of my God. And we, we bear the name of our God which adopted us. We're given liberty. Uh, thou art no more a servant but a son. Galatians 4, 7. He calls us precious and honorable. Isaiah 43, 4. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. He calls us a treasure. Uh, Exodus 19, 5. Then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Calls us jewels in the day when I will make up my jewels. God loves you. He's adopted you into his family. The Bible says, for now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, that we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. What a wonderful thing to be adopted back into the family of God, to be an heir and a joint heir with Christ. A promise of eternal life and a, a heavenly home. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me and my Father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Yes. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I'm glad that I got adopted. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your precious word this morning. We. I pray for Brother Thurman, Lord. You'll hold him up by the power of your might, Lord, and, and bless him and, and uh, let his word touch, let your word through him touch hearts, Lord, and, and, uh, and open minds and, and consciences, consciences, Lord, and, and let us uh, be attentive to the word, the preaching of the word of God, Lord, and glorify yourself in everything. Ask you to put down any high thing that might exalt itself against the knowledge of God today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.